Amen. Thank you. We're working our way through the Apostle Paul's introduction to the book of Romans. The introduction is chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. We've already examined the salutation, verses 1 through 7, and then Paul's short comment about his desire to visit the church in Rome, which was the reason for writing the letter, verses 8 through 15. Last week, we just started the theme of the book, verses 16 and 17. I'll reread that. I am not ashamed of the gospel, Paul wrote, because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Man's greatest problem is that he is not right with God. In the gospel message, God tells us how we can be right with him. We get right with him by embracing the gospel message by faith. The gospel message is Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. We embrace that by faith. We are born again into God's kingdom. Our sins will have been taken care of on Calvary's cross. He gives us his righteousness. We can walk the streets of heaven perfectly acceptable to God. Not because of anything we've done, but because of what he did. James Boyce wrote that these two verses may be not only the most important verses in this letter to the church at Rome, but perhaps the most, two most important sentences in all of literature. I don't think that's an understatement, an overstatement. Now, last week we dealt with the fact that Paul was not ashamed of the gospel. We discussed that. It's very easy in a world filled with people who have no use for our God, have absolutely no use for Jesus Christ, the real Christ, that, that sort of cultural Jesus out there, that, that he's okay. But the real Jesus, they don't really have any use for. So in a society that mocks and ridicules real Christianity, it's easy to be ashamed. And in this this verse, this sentence, God is saying, don't you dare. And shame on you if you are ashamed. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Now, we're going to discuss the gospel. As I've pointed out on more than one occasion, it can be used more than one way. Actually, it can be used two ways. There's a The word itself means good news, and there was the good news of the kingdom. Jesus himself, John the Baptist, came preaching the good news of the kingdom. The good news of the kingdom is that one day the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of Israel, the Messiah, the Anointed One, is going to come to earth, sit on the throne of David, rule the world in righteousness. That's the coming kingdom. That's good news. I'm longing for that. We pray for it in this church. We're eager for it. We talk about it all the time. We're about as eager for it as those first century Jews. Jesus came and he kept telling the apostles about how he was going to have to go to the cross and die for their sins. And they kept saying, yeah, that's nice, but when are you going to set up the kingdom? Well, we're kind of that way here. And the more I live in a world where wickedness reigns, the more I'm offended by the reign of wickedness and sinfulness in so many ways. And the more I want, and I know you want, to see the Lord Jesus Christ come sit on the throne of David and righteousness will cover the earth as the waters cover it today. I mean, just simple things like abortion. One and a half million babies brutally murdered, and we approve of it. We do as a society. There's one political party that brags about it. This is shameful, and it's not going to change, folks until the Lord Jesus Christ comes. So we're eager for the good news of the kingdom. But there's also the good news of salvation, how we can be right with God. And the essence of that message is Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. Now, Paul doesn't define the gospel in these two verses. He defines the gospel in the first five verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we're going to spend some time on this because people need to know what the gospel is. You say, everybody knows what it is. It's the good news. Well, not really. Everyone really doesn't know it. I can't tell you how many times I've heard preachers stand in the pulpit and say, there's more to the gospel than salvation. No, there isn't. No, there isn't. Now, there's more of the Christian life than salvation, I agree. God wants you, after you get saved, to roll up your sleeves and build the kingdom. God wants you to roll up your sleeves and live a godly life. He wants you to be a genuine and honest and virtuous reflection of Jesus Christ. There are lots of things to the Christian life. But there's only one gospel, and, and, and it's defined in 1 Corinthians 15, first five verses. Jesus Christ died for our sins, it was buried, and rose again. That's the gospel of salvation. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take it apart piece by piece. 
so that you understand it thoroughly. We've got to start running against the current that says there's more to the gospel than salvation. There's more to it than this message. This message is the good news. This is the gospel of salvation. Now, let's read through 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 5. Now, we'll be going, we're going to spend some time here, then we'll go back to those two verses in Romans. So we're, we're, th- we're going to be discussing Romans 1, verses 16, uh, fi- uh, 16 and 17, which is the theme of the book. But right now we're going over and going to spend some time in the first five verses of 1 Corinthians 15 because here's where Paul defines the gospel. He wrote to the church at Corinth, Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you were saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. He's not talking about you losing your salvation. What he's saying here is, if you haven't really believed this gospel, then you have believed in vain. What he's talking about are there are lots of folks out there who call themselves Christians. They believe they are Christians, but they're not Christians because they haven't believed the gospel. You understand the point I'm trying to get at here? It's the reason Jesus said on the, at, the great, at, at, at the great white throne judgment, people will say, Lord, Lord, we preached in your name. We perform miracles in your name. He says, I don't know you. This is who he's talking about. Verse 3, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins. Here's his definition. According to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. Okay, let's work our way through it. Paul begins by saying, now brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preach to you. In other words, now at this point, he's writing a letter to the church at Corinth about three or four years after or maybe uh, three or four years after he had founded the church. Remember, it was, he founded the church at Corinth on his second missionary journey. He went into Corinth, preached in the synagogue. Later he went out, preached the gospel. People were saved. He preached the message, the gospel message, the good news message. Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again. They believed that message. They accepted it. They were saved. Now, three or four years later, he's down in Ephesus, and he's getting word that these people are sort of playing games with this gospel message. They're not preaching it the way they should be preaching. They're doing with the gospel what too many of our preachers are doing. They're saying, there's more to the gospel. He's saying, wait a minute, there's more to the gospel. Message of salvation. I want to remind you of the gospel I preach to you. He, what I'm about to write to you about the gospel is exactly what I told you when I was there three or four years ago. And you received it. They had embraced that message. And by this gospel you were saved. The earlier gospel message led to the salvation. The essential truth was, as we pointed out, Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again. Otherwise, you believed in vain. Their faith was in vain if they failed to believe the gospel. As pointed out just a moment ago, not everyone who claims to be a Christian is a real Christian. And we're going to spend some time on this a little later on. But you know full well that um, on page 54, Matthew 7, 21 and 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? In your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? And I I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Now, in Matthew chapter 13, there are a group of parables known as the kingdom parables. And in these parables, Jesus is trying to tell his disciples what the church is going to be about. Now, he doesn't use the word church because nobody knew about this thing called the church. So he says, let me tell you what the kingdom of God is like. 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 There are a whole bunch of parables in which the Lord Jesus Christ is telling us what the kingdom of God is going to be like. In short, what the church is going to be. He was sort of preparing from this gi- preparing his disciples for this gigantic new thing that was coming along called the church. He just called it the kingdom of God. And one thing he said was, it's going to be like a farmer who went out and sowed good seed in his field. And then that night, someone came, Satan came and sowed bad seed in the field. He says, basically the church, or Christendom, think Christendom, professing Christendom, is going to be a mixed bag. I'm going to sow good seed, but Satan's going to sow bad seed. In another parable, parable of the mustard seed, little tiny seed, and it grows to be this gigantic plant, but, and that's what the church, very small seed, yes, very small seed, just a few guys in an obscure little country called Israel, 
in about 33 A.D., just a handful of guys, but suddenly this thing sprouted like a small seed sprouts up to become this gigantic mustard plant, and uh, that's the way the church grew and became gigantic. It covered the world, but he says it also gave shelter to these birds, which are symbolic of Satan and his followers. And then there was the parable of the yeast. And the parable of the yeast is uh, a parable in which he's saying, you know, you start with a little bit of dough. That's the real stuff. That's the flour, right? And what other ingredients, the salt and the other things that women put in it. Then you put some yeast in there and the whole thing puffs up, right? But it's still just a small amount of flour, small amount of wheat. But you put the yeast in there, it fills it up with air. He says, that's really the way the church is going to be. There's going to be, it's really very small. But because of all the false professors, it's going to blow up. But it's all air. It's false. And so what he's trying to tell us in those parables and in and other passages is that uh, there are going to be a lot of folks in this thing called Christendom that are false because they haven't really believed the gospel. And that's what he's getting here. Otherwise, you believed in vain. If you don't believe the gospel, now I'm not going to try to be more complicated than it is, but there are certain things must be believed and embraced for you to be saved. And if you don't believe those, you're not saved. You can call yourself a Christian. As one guy said, you call yourself an airplane, but that doesn't make you one. There are certain things that must be believed and embraced, and that's what this gospel message is all about. Continuing, for what I received, I passed on to you. He continues right here. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. Now, what Paul is about to say, this gospel I'm repeating to you again, is a message. This message of Jesus Christ died for our sins was buried and rose again, is not something I made up. It was not something someone taught to me. I got the message directly from God. That's a very powerful statement. You know, it's one thing, whatever I tell you, I got from somebody else. Count on it. I read the Bible. I read commentaries. I chatted with people. I didn't get anything I say directly from God. But wouldn't that be powerful? Page 55, Galatians 1, verses 11 and 18. Paul, writing to the church of Galatia, said, I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel I preached is not something that man made up. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. From birth, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. But when God, who set me apart from birth, called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not consult any man, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before me. But I went immediately into Arabia and later returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Peter and stayed with him 15 days. Now, what's Paul saying here? Paul was saved personally by the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me on the road to Damascus? He goes on to Damascus. He is thoroughly, thoroughly saved. Then he went down into Arabia where God personally tutored him for three years. So this gospel he's writing about is a message that he received directly from God. That's really powerful stuff. Now, all of it, Scripture is inspired, but this is a double whammy, as it were. For what I received, I passed on to you. It's of first importance. This gospel is the foundation. The essentials are these. Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the Scripture, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the Twelve. And according to the Scriptures, not New Testament, but Old Testament. All of this was prophesied in the Old Testament. That's what he's saying. Now let's go through this a little bit at a time. Let me summarize it. 1 Corinthians 15, 3-5. Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. What must be believed for salvation? First, you have, we, we like to sort of summarize it sometimes by saying you must believe in the person and the work of Christ. And that's a good way to describe it. You have to believe he was who he claimed to be, and the Bible declares him to be, and you must believe that he did what he said he did, the person and work of Christ. When it comes to the person of Christ, men must believe that Christ was the Son of God, the Messiah, and God's sacrifice for sins. On page 56, let me read this. Paul wrote that in the gospel message, we're told that Christ died for our sins. This means that the first demand of the gospel is that we believe in Christ. That is, that we believe that he existed and that he was all that he and the Bible claimed him to be. 
to believe in a fictitious Christ, a Christ that is a distortion of the real Christ, won't cut it. Jesus put it this way, I told you that you will die in your sins if you do not believe that I am the one I claim to be. You must believe what he claimed to be. Now, what did he claim to be? He claimed to be the Messiah. He is not a carpenter that just suddenly appeared on the scene in the first century. He was the promised one. In fact, Paul makes a, a, a big deal of that. Notice this word Christ. Christ is the Greek word for anointed. What's the Hebrew word for anointed? Messiah. What he's saying is that the Messiah died. In short, he is the promised one. He's not just some carpenter that suddenly appeared. And the roots of this go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve sinned. God came down and said, one day, Satan, this woman is going to bear a child. Not a man, not Adam. This woman is going to bear a child. He will crush her head. Didn't get much more information until Abraham came along. And God said, hey, it's going to, the world's going to be blessed through you. In other words, we know now that that meant that this one that's going to crush the, hate, the head of Satan is going to come from you. And then for the next 2,000 years, there were additional revelations that he would be the son of David. He'd be born in Bethlehem. He'd be born of a virgin. And, and all of this, he is... So when you believe in Jesus, you've got to believe he is that promised one. Now, I'm not trying to suggest that in order to be saved, you've got to have a, a thorough understanding of the Abrahamic covenants or the Davidic covenant. Please don't misunderstand. But, you've got to, but when we say Christ, we're talking about the anointed one. The anointed one means Messiah. Messiah is the king of Israel. Israel anointed their kings. They anointed all of them. And one day, they knew that one day a great king would come, the greater son of David, and in time, they call, sort of called him the anointed one. We anointed our priests, we anointed our, we anointed our prophets, we anointed our kings. But one day, there's the anointed one. And they called him the what? Messiah. In Greek, that's Christos. In English, it's Christ. So you must believe he is that one. Now, I know this takes a little time. But this, well, we'll go through. We'll get, I'm getting ahead of myself. So you've got to believe that he is the promised one, that he's fully God, fully man. Jesus said, he, God, I tell you the truth, Jesus said, before Abraham was born, I am. John 17, 5, and now, Father, glorify me with, the pres with me in your presence, with the glory I had with you before the world began. John 20, Jesus did many other miracle, miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. He is the what? Messiah, that you believe he is the Messiah, the promised one, not just some carpenter that showed up. I, I know they say, well, this is going to take a little while to explain it. Take a little time. You want real, you want real converts or a bunch of fakes? who are going to stand at the great white throne. Am I angry? I'm angry because what passes for evangelism is often just nonsense. Take a little time. That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing... You may have life in his name. So, we begin with the person of Christ. You must believe he is the promised Messiah. You must believe he's fully God, fully man. And you must believe he's God's only sacrifice for our sins. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He presented himself in the first century as God's sacrifice for the sins. If you say, I believe in Jesus, but you don't believe that, you're not believing in Jesus. It's not enough to say, oh, I, I believe Jesus was a good man. I believe he died for our sins. But I also believe that there are some nice things in Buddhism and, and Hinduism has some nice gods over here. Doesn't cut it. Jesus says, I am God's only sacrifice for sins. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but my me. He presented himself not only as the Messiah, not only as God-man, but as God's only sacrifice for sins, and unless you believe that he is God's only sacrifice for sins, you haven't believed in him. Because understand, folks, data define people. <laughs> data. Who is this Christ? Well, he is the Messiah. He is fully God, fully man, and he is God's sacrifice for sins. You've got to believe all those things. You haven't believed in him. You beginning to catch on how this works? Now, you believe in the work of Christ. First, Paul said he died for our sins. Well, this presupposes that you believe you're a sinner. 
Understand? you got to presuppose that, 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 that you say, I believe that. Well, do you believe you're a sinner? Well, n- no. <laughs> well, th- there's something illogical here, folks. It presupposes you believe you're a sinner, and that not only you believe you're a sinner, but that you're, you're object of God's wrath against sin, and God's wrath against sin will ultimately be eternity in the lake of fire. You understand? Now, if you don't believe you're a sinner, and as a sinner you are the object of God's wrath against sin destined for hell, then Christ's death on the cross for your sins is meaningless. If you don't believe you're a sinner, and as a sinner you're the object of God's wrath against sin, and that will ultimately lead lead to a turning the lake of fire. You don't need a savior. People who aren't lost don't need to be saved. You, you understand the point I'm trying to get? People pray these little prayers, but they don't believe any, they don't believe the implications of it. Jesus died for your sins. Well that's nice. What else did he do? Well he walked in water. I like that better. And he fed the thousands. So I like that better. No, folks, you are a sinner. As a sinner, you're the object of God's wrath, God's wrath against sin, and you're in deep, deep trouble. At the, in the fullness of time, God put on flesh and came and took the penalty for you. Now, that's a powerful message. You're a candidate. But if you don't believe you're a sinner, and as a sinner, you need a Savior because you're under a death penalty, you haven't believed the gospel. He what? Died for our sins. It, 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 it presupposes that you believe you're a sinner and you need someone to die for your sins. Did you believe, you must believe that he was buried? I'm quoting from 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 5, because that emphasizes the reality of his death. And, and thirdly, you must believe he was resurrected. The resurrection validates Christ's claim to be God. Anybody can die. That takes no talent. No talent at all. Most of us in this room, if the Lord doesn't come, are going to manage that. And uh, I'm sorry we will, but that's it. It takes no talent, but to die and get up out of the grave is something else. Jesus said in John 10, The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take up again. Now, If he wasn't God, he couldn't make that statement. Well, he could make that statement. Lots of foolish men have made that statement. Uh, But they didn't get up out of the grave. When you can get up out of the grave, ah, that helps validate his deity. It validates his work on the cross. The scriptures make it very clear that if he had not, the wages of sin is death. Had he not paid for all our sins while he was on the cross, he would have remained in the grave. Getting up out of the grave not only validates his deity, it validates the fact that on the cross he paid for all our sins. Had he not paid for our sins, he would have had to remain in the grave because the rages of sin is death. I give you more. In your notes, you'll find other scriptures to support that. And finally, the resurrection validates Christianity. In 1 Corinthians, I'm on page 60, Paul wrote this, but if it is preach that Christ has not been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there's no resurrection of the dead? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ was raised. And if Christ was not raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. So you understand what's going on here. The gospel, Paul says, that you must believe, or you believed in vain, is this. Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. In short... The gospel is a message, a good news message about the person and the work of Christ. As to his person, he was the promised Messiah. He was who he claimed to be, fully God, fully man, Messiah, and God's only sacrifice. The work of Christ, you must believe that he did what he said he did. That is, he died for our sins. Presuppose you've got to believe you're a sinner. And that you're under a death penalty. You need a Savior. You need someone to die for your sins. And that he was buried and that he rose again and rising again validates his claim that not only is he God, but that he, in fact, has paid for your sins. This is what you got to believe. You don't have to be a dispensationalist. You don't have to believe in Calvinism. You don't have to believe in a six-day creation. Some will say, that's heresy, David. You, there are lots of things you don't have to believe. You should. I hope everybody's pre-mill, but you don't have to believe that for salvation. 
But don't tell me there's something to the gospel other than the salvation message. That is the gospel. And that's what we have to take out, and that's what we have to encourage people to believe, which means you have to sit down with some of these folks and say, let's start with God. And you say, well, that's sort of obvious. Not it isn't. I've mentioned more than once because it haunts me. Francis Schaeffer saying in the 70s, you, what are you folks doing in the United States? You're not preaching the gospel. What are you talking about, Francis? He said, people have come through here and invited Jesus into their heart. They prayed the sinner's prayer and don't believe in the existence of God. Are you people nuts? This passes for evangelism. It's, it's a farce. So, let's go. The gospel message. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, Paul to the Corinthians. This is what I preached to you three or four years ago, and you received it. And this is what you took your stand on by this gospel message you were saved. If you believe this message, you were saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached, otherwise you believed in vain. If you don't believe this, you aren't saved. For what I received, I received who from whom? From God directly. I passed on to you as of first importance. There's nothing more important than the gospel message. These other issues are secondary issues. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he was raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures, because this was all predicted in the Old Testament. And then he appeared to Peter and then to the Twelve. All right. Now let's go back to Romans. Okay? Because now that we've defined the Gospel, we can understand a little bit better about what Paul is writing about in the 16th and 17th verses of Romans chapter 1. Paul wrote, I am not ashamed of the Gospel. That's that wonderful message. Jesus died for our sins and was buried and rose again. It is the power of God. For the salvation of everyone who believes. It is power, the power of God. It's interesting. The word translated power comes from a Greek word dunamis, which means dynamite. It means it's inherently powerful. Uh, on page 61, Kenneth Weiss wrote, The gospel is God's power resulting in salvation to the one who believes. The conception of gospel as a force pervades the text. The gospel message is not merely a powerful means in God's hands, but in itself a divine energy. William Newell wrote, It is not excellency of speech or wisdom, personal magnetism or earnestness of the preacher, any more than it is the deep repentance or earnest prayers of the hearers that avails, but it is the message of Christ crucified, dead, buried, and risen, which being believed is the power of God. The message, the gospel message, is a powerful message. If the man who hears it understands it. Now, if I had a life jacket up here, life jacket, and I suddenly threw it to Steve, you'd think I was a little bit nuts. You'd probably say, thank you, David. What's this for? And you would set it in the seat and be nice and polite. Or call the guys in white coats. I don't know. It's meaningless to you. I mean, you look at it and say, what's this all about? If, on the other hand, I threw it to you after you'd been bobbing in the middle of the Atlantic for five hours, you'd have an entirely different response. You'd grab it with great eagerness. It would be a very powerful gift. If I throw it to you now, it's not very powerful. There's nothing powerful about it. But if you'd been bobbing up for four or five hours and you're about ready to sink and I threw you a life jacket you would grab it with great gusto. It would be a powerful gift. And so it is with the gospel. We go out there and tell people that Jesus Christ died for their sins, was buried, and rose again. They think, whoopee, is he going to bless my life? I'm going to get more cars in my garage. You know, the problem is it isn't powerful to people who don't believe there's a God, don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, don't believe they're, the, they're sinners and the object of God's wrath against them. You understand where we're going with this? Unless you believe the gospel and the implications of the gospel, it's not a powerful message. And when we have evangelistic crusades and don't explain the gospel to people, don't be surprised that it, if it, that it isn't powerful to people. Now, I can show you, and I'll be talking more in a moment about how you can get people to come forward. We do that all the time with little Madison Avenue tricks, but it's not real. It's phony. The powerful, it's a powerful message. In and of itself, it is dynamite, God says. Well, then why isn't it dynamite to so many people? Because so many people don't believe it. To begin with, they don't believe they're sinners. We've been, we've been, we've been 
primed on the message that we're all wonderful. Two teams, two kids go out and play ball. Both of them get trophies. Everybody's wonderful. This is the age of self-esteem. Everybody thinks they're wonderful. Now, the minute you tell everybody they're wonderful, they have a hard time believing that God doesn't believe that. And if God thinks I'm wonderful, why would he turn me away? Anyway, God is too loving. You see where we're going with all this. Forget Madison Avenue. This is the problem we have with much evangelism. In Madison Avenue marketing, you water down the, the, the negatives and you emphasize the positives. All the obstacles are ignored. If you want to sell cosmetics, you don't talk about the skin rash you might get from it. <laughs> You don't want to talk about how costly it might be. All you do is you talk about the positive. How, what do car salesmen talk about? Well, it's a beautiful car. You'll be comfortable. If you're young, the girls will love you for driving it. Or the boys will love you for driving it. You know the drill. But they don't want to talk about the fact that it's a gas guzzler and it costs you going to cost you a fortune. When you sell and use Madison Avenue techniques, you never talk about the negatives. You only talk about the positives. And one of the saddest things that's happened in 20th and 21st century Christianity is that we've taken Madison Avenue techniques and we've used those Madison Avenue techniques to evangelize the lost. And in doing that, what we're doing is we're removing the obstacles. We don't want to talk about only one God. We don't want to talk about heaven and hell. We don't want to talk about Jesus is God. We don't want to talk about atoning death. We don't want to talk about one one way. Only one, what? Only one God? That's, that's disturbing to some people. Well, what about all the Hindus? And what about all the Buddhists? And that, that's an obstacle. So we, we don't want to talk about that because that's offensive to some people. We don't want to talk about heaven and hell because, after all, God is too loving to send anybody to hell, right? So we don't want to talk about that. And Jesus is God. Well, you know, I had a class in anthropology in school, and they talked about how there were lots of men who, and, and, and women in the in antiquity, who thought they were gods. I mean, didn't they make gods out of Caesars? Sure they did. They would vote on it. The Senate would vote on it. He was a god. So uh, I'm not sure that... I think he was probably a good man. He was probably a wonderful prophet like so many others. But really, God, that's a little tough to take. And then his atoning death, that sounds so yucky. I mean, that sounds so primitive. It sounds like sacrifices. So you don't want to talk about that. Only one way. That means everybody that doesn't know Jesus Christ as his or her Savior goes to hell. That's the truth. But you don't talk about that because that's offensive to lots of people. Notice what I've just done. And my little miserable evangelistic conversation here. I've eliminated talking about only one God. Hell. Jesus is really God. His atoning death in only one way. Why? Because those are obstacles to getting more people to come forward and receive Jesus. There are obstacles. I promise you, I've done lots of street evangelism. I know what I'm talking about. Every one of those points are points that people argue with me about. I like what you have to say, Mr. Stuckey, but I have problems with one or more of those issues. So I found over time that people, evangelists, sort of skip talking about those things. But if they skip talking about those things, guess what they've skipped? The gospel, which God says is the dynamite for bringing people to salvation. They've skipped God's dynamite. Now let's talk about what they do say. This is my conversation with a man named Harry. Harry, would you like to spend eternity in heaven after you die? What do you think Harry's answer is going to be? Why not? <laughs> he's not real enthusiastic because he's heard that there's no beer up there but, and no NFL, but why not? Harry, number two, God promises that you will go to heaven after you die if you just invite Jesus Christ into your heart. Will you do that, Harry? Harry answers, well, I'm not really sure I believe in heaven or hell or God or that Jesus Christ was any more important than any of the other great prophets. That's okay, Harry. Just try him. I promise you, you'll like him. And I promise you, that was a catchphrase in the 70s. Is that was we picked up from Coca-Cola. Remember Coca-Cola? Try it, you'll like it. Try it, you'll like it. And a lot of slick evangelists of my generation, some of them were good, some of them not so good, we picked up the slogan from Coke and said, well, just try it, you'll like it. But notice, Harry hasn't believed anything. Hasn't believed anything. 
We don't even know if he believes in God. Maybe this is God, maybe he is, maybe Jesus is God, maybe he wasn't, maybe I'm on my way to hell, maybe I'm not. you got to believe. But notice Harry says, I'm not sure, but okay, Harry, just okay. it's okay, Harry. Just try him. I promise you'll like him. Harry answers, okay, why not? What have I got to lose? And he prays the sinner's prayer. My friends, Harry is not saved. Can you understand that? Harry is not saved because he hasn't believed what must be believed. He hasn't believed the gospel. It's phony evangelism. It's a farce. We have lots of heartwarming messages. God does love you, friend. And he does want to give you an abundant life. So come forward and, 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 and embrace Jesus. Ain't evangelism, but I promise you what it does, it can get thousands coming forward. And if you get really good mood music, you know how they do it? They play it. It's a game. And we wonder why at the great white throne judgment, but Lord, Lord, I thought I was a Christian. Or why Jesus in those, those kingdom parables said, you know, <laughs> Satan's going to throw a lot of false believers, quote, in the church. In fact, I would say that most of Christendom is made up of false believers. Commentary. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. It is powerful. It's dynamite. Forget the Madison Avenue stuff. Forget the phony evangelism. The gospel message is powerful to those who understand their problem. It's powerful to, to those who know they're on their way to hell. It is powerful to those who know they cannot save themselves. It is powerful to those who believe that God has solved their problem in Christ. Once you believe those things, it is powerful. It's like me throwing you that life preserver. If you know you're going down, it's powerful. You're going to grab it. You'll do anything for it. But if you don't know you're on your way to hell, this gospel message I throw to you is meaningless, folks. Like Harry, you'll pray the little prayer. Why not? What have I got to lose? That ain't salvation. Salvation. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation. Salvation speaks of deliverance or rescue. Saved. It speaks, the note that we say salvation being saved. Saved from what? People like to say they're saved, right? We're saved. You saved? You saved? You saved? When I first got saved in the 70s, I have often run to people who ask me if I was saved, and I would say I'm saved, and they'd say I'm saved, and saved. You know, we're all saved. <laughs> I don't know, somewhere along the line, I would start asking people, well, what are you saved from? What I was shocked to find out is most didn't know what they were saved from. And that's a heartbreaker. I'm saved. Well, saved demands an object. If, if, if a child is in a burning building and you grab him, he's saved from burning to death. If I throw the life raft or, or my, my life preserver to a man who's drowning, I've saved you from drowning. Right? If, if, if you're dying of cancer and I give you a cure for your cancer, you're saved from dying from cancer. If you embrace Christ, you've got to be saved. You say we're saved. But saved from what? And the irony is, folks, most couldn't answer that question. You say, well, that's silly. No. I ran to people all the time. Get out there and mix it up a little bit. It's one of the virtues of getting saved in New York City. It was a big, <laughs> strange community of believers. Lots of strange ones. I was probably one of the stranger. God straightened me out. He's still working on me. But... They didn't know what they were saved from. That's silly. You're saved from the consequences of sin. Past tense, you're saved from the penalty of sin. The minute you accepted Christ, you're saved from the penalty of sin. If you know Christ, you're saved. You've been born again to his kingdom. You're saved from spending eternity in the lake of fire. Present tense, you're saved from the power of sin. The minute we've, remember that little stick figure I threw up there, that when, you, when you're born, you're born with your will plugged into an old sin nature. When you're saved, that cord is cut and God gives you a new nature. Now you still have the old, still got the new. Paul wrote in Galatians, they, 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 they're in competition with each other. They're in conflict with each other. But now you don't have to be a slave to your old sin nature. In addition, you get the Holy Spirit. So when I accepted Christ, I was saved from the penalty of sin. I'm being saved from the power of sin. I can now live a life that's more pleasing to God. And eventually I'm going to be saved from the presence of sin when I'm glorified. That's what I'm saved from. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because of the power of God for salvation. Salvation from the penalty of sin, from the presence of sin, and from the future from the presence of sin. Continuing on. First for the Jew, then for the Gentiles. 
Salvation was first promised to Adam and Eve. When God came down, I spoke about it a moment ago in the third chapter of Genesis. One day this woman, this woman is going to bear a child that will crush your head, Satan. Didn't give much information until Abraham came along and basically what God was saying, the world's going to be blessed through you. So we got to know that the, this great Savior that would crush the head of Satan and set us free would come from Abraham. Later on, they would be in the family of David, born in Bethlehem, and you know about many of the prophecies. The salvation was promised first to Adam and Eve, and it's been fulfilled through the Jews, and it was given to the Jews first because it came from them. Jesus said in uh, page 66, let me read a passage. That the gospel is from the Jew first. Get over it, Gentiles. It's to the Jew first. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre. He was up in Galilee at the time. Just Tyre inside, the Canaanite woman from the vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David. Notice he's a Jew. And she knew he was the Messiah. Son of David, she knew he was the Messiah. What a woman. Three quarters, 90% of the Jews didn't recognize him as the son of David. But here's this Canaanite woman who did. That's Holy Spirit, of course. Canaanite uh, woman... From the vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him, Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall the master's table precious passage and jesus answered woman you have great faith your request is granted and your daughter was healed from that very hour salvation came through the jew the gospel message is to the jew first and we know geographically that the gospel was first preached where jerusalem shortly after jesus christ ascended into heaven then when there was persecution in jerusalem they were kicked out they went to the surrounding area which was samaria and then to the gentile world I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for the salvation. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. We've talked about this before. Man's great problem can be stated two ways. The negative way, we're destined for hell. Positive way, we need righteousness to go to heaven. In these two verses, Paul speaks of man's problem both ways. Negative way, he spoke about salvation. In Jesus Christ, we're saved from spending eternity in the lake of fire, right? And also need to be righteous to walk the streets of heaven. You need to keep both these ideas in mind in the subject of salvation. Because in the Old Testament... They very rarely talked about being saved from eternity in the lake of fire because they didn't have any concept of that. What they did have a great concept of was that God was holy and they had to be holy or righteous to walk with him. So that was their idea. And as we work our way through the book of Romans, that's going to be the way Paul discusses salvation. He's going to discuss it on the positive side rather than the negative side. He's going to be saying, let me tell you a way to be righteous. Let me tell you a way to be righteous. And that's what he's saying here. Men can be righteous and it's all by faith. That's what this gospel message is about. God is saying, you folks have a problem. You need to be righteous. I have this wonderful message, this gospel message. It's a very powerful message. It tells you how to be righteous by faith. And then he quotes Habakkuk, the righteous will live by faith. Faith, man receives righteousness from God. Excuse me, faith. Men receive the righteousness that God provides through faith. Faith is the one requirement of the Old Testament saints. Faith is... All that is required of the New Testament saved. And then saving faith is more than intellectual assent. I talked about this briefly last week. Let me just spend a little more time on it. Saving faith has an intellectual element, an emotional element, and a volitional element. The intellectual element is knowledge. We just talked about that. There's some things that must be believed. Have faith means that you believe in something. You've got to believe in the person and work of Christ. I hope I've convinced you of that. Has to have a certain amount of knowledge. Get away from that receiving business. Talk about believing over and over. Believe, believe, believe. You've got that, that's the intellectual element. You've got to believe that Jesus was who he claimed he was and that he accomplished what he said he accomplished on Calvary's cross. There's an emotional element. You can believe all that. But have a whole hum attitude. You can sort of say, well, 
That's interesting. I believe that's probably a historical fact. But you don't, you don't feel convicted. You don't necessarily feel that that is something that you need. And that's the conviction element. On page 70, reading in John 16, 8, Jesus said this about the coming Holy Spirit. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. This is where the Holy Spirit comes. And I've given you a lot more quotes on there. Uh, one from ends. Conviction involves emotions. This element emphasizes that the person has not only an intellectual awareness of the truth, but that there is an inner conviction of this truthfulness. So you start out with this fact that Jesus Christ was who he said he was, fully God, fully man, the Messiah. He died on the cross for our sins, was buried and rose again. So I've got that down. The next step is, I think I'm a sinner. I'm in desperate need. That's where the Holy Spirit comes in. Convicts, convicts you as an individual that you really need this salvation that Christ provides. I think there are a whole lot of folks who call themselves Christians who've never been convicted by the Holy Spirit that they're in desperate need of the Savior because they've never really embraced Him. So the first step is you've got to have knowledge. That's the intellectual element. The second one is you've got to recognize that you're a sinner in desperate need of it. And the third element is volitional. You've got to trust. Now, the word believe in the New Testament comes from a Greek word, pistao. And it means a lot more than intellectual assent. It means it's more than just believing a historical fact. To believe, to pistao, is to trust in, to rely on, to cling to, to adhere to. It means more than just saying, oh, that's a nice fact, historical fact, and moving on. It's believing in the terms of trusting and embracing. I've used this illustration before. You're dying of septicemia. That's a bacterial infection of the blood. Doctor comes in with a syringe filled with penicillin. It will cure it. It's great. Penicillin is still a great drug for septicemia. And you believe the doctor, and you believe that the penicillin will cure your septicemia, Right? But until you let the doctor give it to you, it doesn't do you any good, right? Believing it isn't enough. To believe, it's an intel, as an, as an, as an, to believe it intellectually, to recognize that it's a fact, isn't enough. One has to embrace it. And that's what this word believe means. It means to adhere to, to cling to, to trust in, to rely on. Until you allow him to do that, first you've got to be convinced that you have septicemia and you're dying and you need it. That's the conviction part. So you begin with, I have septicemia, the, the penicillin will cure it. Okay, that's intellectual. Now, the doc but you know, a lot of folks don't take the cures that doctors offer them, do they? This is where the conviction comes in. Let me tell you, Steve, you really do have septicemia, and you really need, nah, nah, nah. I'm like, I'm like John Wayne, I'll tough it out with a bottle of scotch. That was almost, have you ever heard of these people? I'm going to fight cancer. I'm going to say, How do you, what do you fight it with? You better fight it with some of the drugs. Now I'm going to fight the septicemia on my own by strict willpower. Well, you're in trouble. <laughs> so conviction, first there's knowledge, then there's conviction. I need it. And then the third part is the trust part. I'm going to take it. You understand how this works? Intellectually, you have to believe that Jesus Christ was who he said he was and that he did on the cross what he said he did. That's intellectual. There's certain things you just have to believe are true. Conviction. You've got to believe you're a sinner in desperate need of that. And thirdly, you've got to embrace it. You say, well, surely if you're convicted, you would embrace. I didn't. I understood this truth when I was four years old. I was arguing with God. And I kept saying, I, I kind of like, you know, what they're doing out there in the sinful world. The day I got saved, I was arguing. I was 30 years old, I was arguing with God. I wanted five more years to sail my boat around the globe. I've been having this argument with God since I was four. I believed when I was four years old the gospel. I also was convicted. I knew I was a sinner. But I didn't embrace until I was 30. So when I talk about embrace, I really I know firsthand what this is about. You're looking and you're saying, how could you be such a fool? Because I'm totally depraved piece of garbage. 
That's what depravity is, folks. Wait till we get to chapter 3. You think I'm bad. You're going to find out about yourself. (laughs) Depravity is blind and stupid. I was blind and stupid and disgusting. I, I was playing the odds. I was hoping my plane wouldn't crash. Well, I'd get hit by a car before I had a chance to embrace Christ. But meanwhile, I wanted to sin. And it was for no other... You say, well, well, it's because you grew up in a Christian home. It was too strict. No, it wasn't. I had loving, wonderful parents. Well, the church was too legalistic. No, they weren't. They were great. You were ashamed of the gospel. Well, a little bit. In the circles I ran in, people thought this was a bit hokey. But most of all, I loved sinning. And that's what sin does. People love it. So you've got to believe certain things to be true. Folks, you've got to believe it. There's a whole bunch you don't have to believe, but you've got to believe those essentials we just went over. The next phase is you got the Holy Spirit to work in you and convince you that you're a sinner in desperate need of the Savior. There are people, I'm sure, in hell who believe the historical realities of the gospel, but they were never convinced that they needed it and they never embraced it. That's the reason people are going to be saying at the judgment seat, Lord, Lord, we preach the gospel in your name. We're talking about preachers. He said, I didn't know you. So it wasn't they didn't know. Knowledge, conviction, and then, Doc, put the penicillin in. I was 30 when I got to the third phase. Disgusting testimony, folks. Some of you embraced Christ the moment you really understood. Some of us don't have that wonderful testimony. These are the three elements. Pistao, to trust in, to rely on, to cling to. You've got to embrace the cure. Righteousness is by faith. Many have believed in vain. We've talked about this. We've talked about the parables. And uh, in 2 Corinthians 11, Paul wrote, For such men as are false prophets, deceitful workmen, masquerading as apostles of Christ, and no, word, no wonder... For Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. Do you understand what we're talking about? The gospel. It's a wonderful message. Jesus Christ was the Messiah, fully God, fully man. He died for our sins, was buried and rose again. It's a powerful message to a man who knows he's a sinner. He's on his way to hell, and Christ can save him. It's the only cure, and he embraces him pistao by faith. He, he does more than just give intellectual assent to it. He embraces it. He trusts in it. He relies on it. I don't want to make it more complicated than it is. But there's a certain amount of information people have got to understand. This whole idea of God just loves you, He does love you. That He wants to give you an abundant life, He does want to give you an abundant life. People need to have more information than that to get saved. Come to Jesus. What does that mean? That's not salvation. Harry, you want to go to heaven? Why not? I hope that haunts you, because that's what passes for evangelism too much out there. Shame on us. What makes it really bad is you run into Harry a couple years later. Oh, I'm saved. I'm born again. But he's not. He's not. And that's terrible. Father, we love you.